Welcome to more course on introduction to proteogenomics. In the last lecture, you were introduced to the effect of mutations on gene expression and how they could alter the signaling pathways. You are also taught about how these mutations can lead to the modifications of phosphocytes and play role in downstream signaling processes. Today's lecture by Dr. Kerstin Krug is a continuation of the last lecture and he will cover the use of two important tools active DB and MIMB. So, we are going to go quickly through the different steps here. I mean here the, the idea is to get the principle how it works. So, if you do not understand like all the details that is that's not crucial to, you know to for our hands on session. But I mean this is again very similar to what we have just looked at. So, you have two sets uh, of phosphocyte collection. Um, so, one is um, okay. So, this is actually how we built the, 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 the model here. So, one is all positive kinase phosphocytes. So, these are known su substrates and then to get a like a background data set or like a, a, a negative distribution you choose uh, random negative phosphocytes. And then you construct your model and then you use a Bayesian approach to uh, you know to determine whether your phosphocyte that you that you are interested in is comes from a negative distribution or from the positive distribution. So, this is uh, you know Mani was talking about mixture modeling yesterday and this is kind of a related approach here. So, in this case amino acid frequencies are calculated by what they call a precision weighted matrices. Uh, again it is very similar to what we what we have looked at, but so it is it is the relative frequency of each amino acid um, at each position. So, again we have the positions on the x axis and the amino acids on the y axis and they add some some error term here. So, that is that is basically the only difference. So, from, and from that you can already calculate these um, sequence windows here. So, in order to yeah in order to calculate the score for your for a specific phosphocyte they came up with these with this matrix similarity score which is actually a concept that has been introduced by, for, for genomics sequence analysis. So, again like the, the, the principle is you want to calculate you want to calculate a score given a phosphor sequence how likely it is or how similar is it to my position weight matrix matrix here. So, this is this you have for each kinase and you calculate a score for each phosphocyte how likely or how similar is it to that motif. And you know it is it is it is based on on information content um, again so we do not have to, to to go into too much detail here, but what you do you calculate the phosphocyte the, the score for your sequence uh, you, you subtract the minimum given your matrix and you scale it by, by the range. So, in order to build up these, these Bayesian models what the software does it calculates exactly this score for all known binding sites. This is one distribution this is the blue distribution here and then in order to get a negative uh, distribution it takes randomly sampled phosphocytes from the human proteome. Right. And then it can it calculates again all of these scores and then you end up having a negative distribution. And then for a given this is what I just said and then for a given peptide let us say now you are looking at your peptide that you measured you get a score which is my, maybe here and then using using Bayesian theory we can calculate the probability whether this score is more likely to be uh, derived from that distribution or from that distribution that is the entire concept. So, now with this approach we can actually calculate kinase substrate specificity given a phosphopeptide how likely it is that it has been calculated by uh, phosphorylated by this particular kinase or maybe by another one. So, now how do we connect that to mutations? So, we basically calculate these specificities for both uh, versions. So, one is the wild type phosphocyte and then if, if there is mutation that happened in this sequence window here we calculate the same specificity you know using the mutated sequence right. 
And these, again, these are, can be known cancer mutations from TCGA, or you can upload your own mutations. That's both possible. And so then you basically look for, for differences in these probabilities. So one is your wild type. Was it very likely that you know, kinase, Aurora kinase B uh, phosphorylated this wild type sequence? And now after the mutation, how likely is it that still Aurora B can, can phosphorylate that? So this is how MIMP uh, you know, calculates uh, the effect of, of, or predicts the effect of mutations on these kinase binding motifs. So this is the entire concept of MIMP. And I hope that we will make that work during the hands-on. So this is one example output here that you get from, from MIMP. Um, so basically, this is the mutation that I fed in. So it's an arginine uh, at 1,555, which has been mutated into a lysine affecting this particular gene here. And here you actually see. Um, you know, the, the sequence window, so this is the wild type sequence window. It has this arginine at position minus 3. And after the mutation, this arginine has been replaced by a lysine. So in here, in this case, we see that um, the predicted effect is actually a loss of phosphorylation. Um, exactly. So the, the motive is gone. So I don't see ah, yeah. So. Uh, the wild type sequence uh, has a probability of 0.97 to be phosphorylated by AKD1, which apparently recognizes the, the arginine at minus 3. After mutation, AKD1 is no longer able to phosphorylate it, to, to phosphorylate this, uh, this site. So, this is how we read these kind of plots here. And then for the same site, you have uh, uh, other kinase motifs. I mean, what I probably forgot to mention is these kinase motifs are very loose and not very specific. So many kinases share the same motif or at least parts of the motif, right? As we can see here, um, you know, uh, this here, CAMK2A also is able to recognize an arginine in it. Yeah, it, uh, loss means AKT cannot phosphorylate this phosphocyte anymore. So that's just an example. I mean, we will go through more examples doing hands-on, I hope. So here you see, so these are the, the scores that we've calculated a couple of slides back for the wild type sequence. It's 0.6 um, for the wild type sequence. And this is for the mutated sequence, almost zero, right? And you know, this difference kind of uh, determines the probability. Further questions? Before I move on to this is actual data from a patient. Um, so the question was whether this is real data or like a, some example data. But this is a TCJ sample that I've used here. Can you use the mic, please? Because the R and the both have the same nature, so it is highly unlikely that. So what you're saying is it's very unlikely that this is a loss because it's too unspecific? I mean, the data that goes into this analysis is real data. But I mean, you know, keep in mind, these are all predicted events, right? So we don't know. Of course, yeah. So I mean, using the, the, this computational framework, which I just uh, you know, tried to explain to you, we calculate, given this data, we calculate the probability you know, that this might happen, given our statistical framework. So that's not an experimental proof that this phosphorylation site is actually lost, right? And also, you must uh, you know, know that we, for, we don't know these kind of sequence motifs for all kinases. So this model has been trained on 120 kinases or so, right? 
for which we actually have very highly curated, high quality uh, substrate sites. So it might very likely be that this phosphorylation uh, you know, site after it has been mutated can be recognized by any other kinase that we might not know the motive of. Right? Again, so this is all computational, it's all predicted, but you know, it's a way to kind of approach these kind of relationships between mutations and signaling. Sure, but you know, I'm not the one who's going to the red lab, so that's your part. Well, you know, sure. So, I mean, what goes in here are phosphocytes that I've measured, or that, that has been measured, like in the lab, you know, that have been measured in the sample, in the patient sample in this case. And also, we have genomics data that comes from the same patient, right? Mutation. Somatic mutations in a patient. So these are the data that goes into this analysis. All right, as I already mentioned, so you can access MIMP on a, on a web server. So I uh, encountered a couple of difficulties while trying to run analysis on a web server. So that's why actually we, I decided to use the R package. Um, okay. Let's, let's move on. So the, the second tool I briefly want to talk about in the next 10 minutes or so is it's more like a database. It's, it's not really like a tool, but this database also enables you to upload your own mutations and see what you know, could possibly be the effect of these mutations on phospho signaling events. Again, so these are all predictions, right? So we, there's no validation whatsoever. So active driver DB, is a very, um, very well-developed, uh, very complete data, uh, database, proteogenomic database that annotates disease mutations, but also population variants and relates them to, to PDMs. So we have like two major types of omics data, which has been integrated here. So one are like post-translation uh, post modification sites, um, like more than 380,000 and also like more than 3.5 or 3.6 million SNPs. <laughs> and yeah, uh, so, so basically it also predicts network rewiring, rewiring impact of mutations. And also it uses actually the MIMS software we just talked about. So it basically comes from the same lab. So there are three types of human genome variation data sets that goes in here. So one is TC, uh, TCGA, the other are uh, uh, disease mutations that come from the clean, clean far database and also mutations from the 1000 genomes project. So it, again, it uh, uses these publicly available data sets, but also enables the user to upload your own mutation files. And again, this is something that we are trying to do during hands-on. So in terms of proteomics and interaction data, it uses uh, you know, data that is available in several different databases like PhosphoCyplus, PhosphoEML, and the Human Podium Reference Database. Um, and in terms of PDMs, we are, we are not only looking at phosphorylation here, we are also looking at uh, acetylation, ubiquitylation, and methylation. And it also pulls in information of, uh, you know, drug enzyme interactions and also uh, PDM site-specific protein interactions. So these are all, you know, these, these information are all passed from publicly available databases and now are gathered in one place. And it's a very nice, very intuitive user interface which enables you, uh, you, know, you, you know, everybody who doesn't have the computational skills to do these kinds of analysis to, to do those. So what you do, uh, is, is very similar to what we've, uh, you know, what we've learned in, in the previous uh, part of the talk. So we look, uh, so we combine genome variation with PDM data, and you basically map SMVs and PDMs to your protein sequence and look what are the non-synonymous events in your protein, and you calculate uh, motifs or using, you know, the, the effect of mutations on the motif around that. But again, so here we are not only looking at phosphorylation, but also at other modifications. So 
and it's, it, it's very interactive, this entire web, web page. There's many different uh, ways how to view your data. So one is a sequence view where you have, where you can look at your protein sequence uh, you know, along the x-axis and then you have like all mutation events or PDM events, uh, you know, highlighting in this, in this protein sequence. So you can actually look at distribution of PDMs along the sequence. And it also has a, a way to, to uh, build up these interactive uh, network views between proteins, kinase and trucks, and PDMs, and, and, and so on and so forth. So this is something, again, we are going to explore during the hands-on session. So there is a web server available, uh, which works pretty well. And also, there is a GitHub page where you can uh, access the tool. You can download it. You can fork it. You can modify it and run it locally on your, your computer. So to sum up, uh, mutations affect signaling networks. I don't think that there's any doubt that this is not going to happen, or that, this, that this is not happening. Um, so there's millions of mutations that have been identified that are associated with cancer, but we still don't know the exact molecular mechanism. So how, so what is the uh, association between phenotype and genotype, or genotype and phenotype? So and I think that the integrative analysis of these mutations in MPDN has a great potential to shed light into these kind of relationships. And here I just pointed out two of these tools. There's many out, and there's also many uh, you know, uh, ongoing efforts. So I know that, that Bing's group is also working on a very nice uh, tool that uses uh, deep neural networks to look into these kind of relationships. So I just picked these two because there's, they're kind of easy to use and very intu intuitive to use, and the output is very easy to interpret, and so on and so forth. This does not mean that these are the best tools, right? And here I just put uh, you know, a lot of references for all of the papers and, and tools that I've used here in, these, uh, in my talk. Today you were introduced to two tools, namely MIMP and Active Driver DB, which have been used to explore the mutations and their effects on a few cancers. You are also shown how MIMP predicts the gain or loss of a mutation by calculating a probabilistic score at different locations in a given sequence. Active DB is another proteogenomic database that annotates disease mutations and population variants as PTMs. It also provides information about various molecular interactions from publicly available databases. There are many more tools freely available and you are encouraged to try out using them and then you will explore many features which could really help you for much better and deeper understanding. In the next lecture, we will look at pathway enrichment using a few widely used tools and softwares. Thank you.